Hello. Today we're going to look at the sum over paths theory which was developed by Richard Feynman. And that's for A-level physics. Let's just remind ourselves of the principles of waves. What we have said in other videos is if you drop two stones into a pond of still water that will create ripples or waves. And where those waves overlap you get interference. Interference means that where you get two crests of a wave coming and joining together, that becomes a double crest. If you get two troughs coming together, you'll get a double trough. That's called constructive interference. But if you get a trough, sorry, a crest from one wave meeting a trough from another wave, then you just get flat water. That's destructive interference. If this were light, then this would produce bright light, but this would produce darkness because there is no um, signal there at all. So essentially, if we reproduce that by looking at sine waves, we can say, here is a sine wave, which looks something like that. And if we add it to another sine wave, which we say is completely in phase, because look, it follows precisely what is happening with the one above, then that is going to generate the two combined will what's called, you get superposition, the two combined in exactly the same way, the same principle of here, the whole thing just adds up. Where you've got zero, that's assuming this is a zero point here, this is the plus direction, this is the minus direction. Two zeros are always going to be zero, but when you get to here, you're going to get a double amplitude. So you're going to get a wave, it's still going to be the same frequency, it's just that the amplitude of the wave is going to be that much larger. On the other hand, if you take the same wave again, but this time you add it to a wave that is exactly 180 degrees out of phase, by which I mean that it looks like this. So now you've got a crest and a trough, a trough and a crest, a crest and a trough. When you add all that together, you just get flat, um, nothing. Now what Richard Feynman did with the idea of sum over paths was to develop the concept of phasers. Phasers, I have to tell you, are not guns used by spacemen. What they are is a means of describing um, the state of a wave. So if I draw again a sine wave, and I'm just going to draw one complete wave. This of course is the wavelength. That is one wave. That is also one cycle. We sometimes call that one wavelength, or we can call that two pi radians because it is um, a complete cycle, two pi radians. Or you can even call it 360 degrees because it is one complete cycle. Then what you do is you represent each point of that wave by a phaser. And the way the phaser works is like this. When you start out with the phaser pointing as it were east, and the phaser will now move anti-clockwise through 360 degrees in the same time as it takes for one complete cycle. So by the time the phaser has finished, it will be back facing east again. But what it actually does is it goes around anti-clockwise so that by the time it's got to this point here, it's half, it's a quarter of the way around its journey. By the time it's got to this point here, it's a halfway through its journey. By the time it gets to this point here, it's three quarters of its way around its journey. And when it gets here, it's completed a cycle. So you can see where it would be here, for example, it's almost pointing along the line. Here, it's almost pointing along the line. Here, it's sort of pointing that way. Here, it's pointing that way. So if I use a match as a phaser, that's my match. The uh, tip of the match is the, the direction in which the phaser is pointing. What it's going to do is it's going to do a full 360 degree twist um, 
in the time it takes for the wave to go like this. So essentially it's going, going to go round like that, then it's going to go 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 like that, and finally it's going to end up like that. So the phaser has done a full 360 degree turn in the time it takes the wave to do one complete cycle. How does that help? Well, it enables us to say that whereas before I said if you have two crests coming together, you get a double crest, now we can represent those crests by the position of the phaser, which you'll notice is pointing straight up. So that can be represented as two phasers coming together, pointing straight up. And if you regard those as vectors, then you would just double the length of the vector. And so you've now got the superposition of two in-phase waves producing a double um, uh, crest, as it were. And similarly, whereas we described two troughs in that way, you would look at the phases for a trough are like that and like that, and vectorially added together, you get a double length trough. On the other hand, um, we said if you took a trough, sorry, a crest and a trough and added it together, we expect to get nothing. Well, what's a, um, in phaser terms, a trough is that way, pointing upwards, this is a, uh, the trough is an arrow pointing downwards. And so these two are represented by an up and a down. And if you do that vectorially, you end up with nothing. So if we look at these two waves here, on which I have marked the phases in the usual way, we can see that this wave, the top wave, is a quarter of a wavelength, uh, which is pi over two, which is uh, 90 degrees ahead of this wave, because the peak of this wave occurs ahead of the peak of this wave. And this is a complete wavelength. So in other words, one complete cycle is a wavelength. And this is a quarter of that wavelength ahead of this wave here. But the advantage of uh, phases is that you do not need to draw all these diagrams in order to show it. All you need to do is to pick um, phases, and you can do this really at any stage. Um, this, of course, is a time axis, and uh, this is the magnitude of the wave at any given time. So let's take uh, the position at this time here, and what we've got is this is a phaser that is in this direction. This is a phaser that's in this direction. What is the angle between them? 90 degrees that tells you that the waves are 90 degrees out of phase. The advantage, of course, is that if you haven't got waves that are either a wavelength or half a wavelength or a quarter of a wavelength, they might just be any angle out of phase, and that might be quite difficult to determine um, from the shape of the waves. But if you draw that that is the phaser at any given time from one wave, and that is the phaser at any given time, sorry, at the same time for the other wave, then the angle between them tells you by how much they are out of phase. And now we come to Richard Feynman's uh, clever idea. His idea was that if you have a source of light and you have a, a point at which that light is going to reach, you might think that the photons of light travel let's call this point A and call that point B, you might think that they travel from point A, a to B uh, in a straight line, um, and that's all there is to it. But Richard Feynman came up with the idea that the photons, which he also called quanta, uh, because they contain, remember, um, E equals HF, F is the frequency of the light, H is Planck's constant, E is the energy of the photon, uh, of the photon and that is a quantized amount because it's quantized in amounts of H. So uh, they are called a quantum. So a photon can be a quantum, an electron can be a quantum. But what Richard Feynman said was that the photon, that any given photon will uh, try every conceivable path. So if you ask which way does a photon go from A to B, the answer from Richard Feynman is, it goes always, 
it can, you just draw any old paths you like. There are, of course, an infinity of them. But according to him, photons try every possible path. And of course, the phasor for each path will be rotating with the frequency of the radiation. So, you know, if the light is a particular frequency, that frequency is not only the frequency of the light, but the frequency with which the phasor uh, rotates. And so for each path, you can calculate how many, fa how many complete rotations of the phasor there will be. And then there may be an, a fraction of a rotation in order uh, before the photon reaches point B. And it's that fraction which matters. And we'll come back to that in just a little while. But let's just see how this pans out in Young's double slit experiment, which we've covered in other videos. The idea is that there is a single source of light, monochromatic, and we have two slits, we have a screen. And normally we talk about there being fringes on this screen as a result of the interference patterns. But now we're going to talk about it in terms of Feynman's idea that photons take every possible path. So let's just imagine one photon coming from the source. Now, according to Richard Feynman, that photon can take any path it likes. So I'm just going to pick one path. And now I'm going to say, let's take another path for the same photon. Don't forget there are an infinite number of these paths and they could all end up anywhere. I just happen to have taken two paths that happen to arrive at the same place on the screen, which I'll mark as X. Now, Feynman says that the phasor is rotating with the frequency of the light on each of these paths. But of course, the length of those paths is different. And so consequently, when you get to the X point X, although the phaser will be in the same position when it starts, when you get to the resultant position, you may find that the phaser that has come that way is in this position. But the phaser of the of as it were the route that came this way might be in this position. And so now you're in a position where you can do what's called vectorial sum of the two. Phasors act like vectors. And you can find the resultant phasor by doing what is straightforward vector addition. That's tip to tail. So you take one phasor, that's that one, and then you do tip to tail. So that will be something like that. And then the resultant is just the distance between the tail of the first and the tip of the last. And that is the resultant phasor pointing in that direction. This gives you an indication of the extent to which this will be light or dark. The point being that if the photons from, sorry, if the photon coming both ways, in both cases would end up with phasors in the same direction, then the resultant phasor going tip to tail will be the maximum length. Thus, this will be a bright spot. On the other hand, if the consequence of the two paths were that the phaser from this path was upwards and the phaser from this path was downwards, then the vectorial addition of these two will give you nothing. And consequently, this will be a dark spot. So this is the way in which Feynman interprets the way Young's slit experiment works. Now, of course, this is all deeply rooted in quantum mechanics, so we can't go into the detail for A-level purposes of what's behind this all, but it turns out that the probability of a quantum arriving at point X is proportional to the resultant phasor squared. So that is the resultant phasor so consequently, if the resultant phasor is at a maximum, which is what we showed here, then you're going to get maximum probability of a quantum of uh, energy arriving at that point 
and therefore that's going to be a very bright point. If the resultant is zero, as it is in this case, then the probability of a quantum arriving at x is zero squared, which is zero, and consequently there will be no light at that point. So let's just take two examples. Suppose the resultant um, phasor, that is the vectorial sum of the two phases arriving at a particular point, have a magnitude r equals 3, and at another point on the screen we'll have a resultant with a magnitude of 2. So essentially we're just talking about different points on the screen, maybe this is x, maybe this is the other point, call that y. So let's say that the resultant at point x is 3, the resultant at point, two, at point y is 2. What is the probability of a quantum arriving at point x? Well, it's going to be 3 squared, which is 9. What is the probability of a quantum arriving at point y? Well, it's going to be 2 squared, which is 4. And what that tells you is that the uh, position x will be 2 and a quarter times brighter than the position at y. So let's apply uh, Feynman's idea to a mirror. Now we would normally say that if you have a source of light, it will strike the mirror at an incident angle i, and it will be reflected at an incident angle, sorry, at a reflected angle r, where i equals r, into your eye here. And that's all that's happening. The light is travelling rather like that. But Feynman would say, no, that is not true. In fact, the light from uh, this uh, point here is travelling in all possible paths. Uh, and there are obviously, again, an infinite number of them. But what you discover when you add up the resultant phases um, at the point at which this light is being observed is that it is the phasors from the shortest distance, which of course is the straight line to the mirror and the straight line back, with an angle of incidence and reflection equal, that's the shortest distance, and therefore the shortest time, that contributes most, nearly all, to the resultant um, amplitude or quanta, if you like, of the light arriving, and that the light that comes from any other direction largely cancels out, by which I mean that the resultant from one path will cancel the resultant from another. So if the resultant from one path is like that, you'll get a, a resultant from another path that's like that. The two are therefore cancelled out. And all of those paths cancel, um, or pretty much cancel, except for the one path that is the one we normally assume to be the case, the shortest time path. So most of the probability that a photon will arrive at your eye comes from what you would classically expect, the shortest distance, shortest time path. So remembering that the uh, probability of the quanta, of the quanta arriving um, is equal to, or is proportional to, the resultant phase or squared, and that that probability is a measure of the intensity of the um, light that is arriving, we get this result that the final phaser of the quickest path, that is this here, will contribute most to the resultant amplitude and the probability of the quantum arriving at that point. So it is the resultant phaser of the quickest path that you square to get the probability of the quantum and hence the intensity of the radiation that is arriving. That is not to say that every other path completely cancels out, but they are such the, the resultant phasers from every other path contribute such a minimal amount that you can regard the quickest path as having the dominant effect. And of course, this immediately leads to one of the um, old ideas that I studied called the rectilinear propagation of light, which is a mouthful. It simply says light travels in straight lines. The reason being that if you're going from A to B, what we're saying is 
that the light that will have the principal effect at B will be the light that is travelled in the quickest time. And the quickest time from any from one point to another point is the straight line. So hence the classic idea that light travels in straight lines can also be accounted for by Feynman's idea of the sum over paths of all the resultant phases. But you might immediately respond that that isn't always true. It isn't true in refraction. For example, if we've got air and water and we have a source of light in the water such that the light goes up like this at an angle of incidence, it will then be refracted. It will be bent out of the water at an angle of refraction R and we will observe it with our eyes. And now you will say to me, this is not a straight line. There is a shorter line, of course, which is the direct line into the eye. Feynman, of course, will say, well, the photon doesn't just take this path. It does indeed take this path, the straight line path, and it takes every other path as well. But all the paths apart from the shortest time path will largely cancel out and it is the shortest time path that will have the dominant effect. And the shortest time path is indeed the path where the uh, light is bent. Why is that? Because for this part of the path, the photon is traveling in water and in water it travels slower. So in fact, it takes longer to travel a certain distance in water than it does in air. Consequently, if it were to take a straight line path, which is the one you might think it would take, you'll notice that it would be traveling in water for a much longer distance and therefore would take a longer time. So it turns out that the shortest time for a photon to travel from this point to this point is to go up here and then along here because it's then traveling slower in water, but for a shorter amount of time. And you'll remember that when light travels in water, its frequency stays the same. So since the speed is equal to the wavelength times the frequency, if the frequency stays the same, but the speed goes down, then obviously the wavelength must also go down. So the wavelength reduces in water and the frequency remains the same. If the frequency remains the same, then the frequency of rotation of the phasor remains the same. So it doesn't matter what medium the light is in, the rotation of the phasor will remain the same. And the key question is, what will the resultant phasor be when that photon reaches your eye? So let's just consider that principle in relation to a convex lens. We use a convex lens to focus light. So let's take light, which is coming from, as it were, a distant source. And we can imagine that the phases of the photons are all um, in sync. So they are all in phase as the light comes along in parallel because they've all emerged from a point which is a long way away, but they've all traveled exactly the same distance because they are traveling in parallel lines. So the phases will all be in phase. And now we want to focus that light onto a point. So all of this light will focus onto a single point. And clearly, in order to focus on a point, you need maximum resultant phases from, for all of that light. It's no use if the light all cancels out because then you won't get an image. But of course, what we can say is that the distance that this beam travels to the um, focal point is greater than the distance that that photon travels to the focal point. And you might therefore think that under those circumstances, um, you have got uh, a di difference. We're looking at the photon that takes the least time. That was the principle. That's the one that contributes the maximum um, resultant to the uh, intensity of the light. But what you find in fact is that all of these beams will take exactly the same amount of time to get to the focal point. The reason being, of course, that this 
photo or the photon as it were path that comes along here will have to travel a much longer distance in glass where it will slow down but then it doesn't have quite so far to travel to the focal point whereas the photon that takes this path or the path of the photon here is spending less time in the glass so it's not slowed down by, by so much as this one is but it then has further to travel when it gets out of the glass and the combination of slowing down here but not so far to travel and slowing down for less time here but further to travel means that for each of these beams each of these photon paths is the least time consequently you get the resultant phaser is high therefore you get the probability of arriving is the resultant phaser squared and that's why you get a good image at the focal point. And since all that's a little on the complicated side, I'll just do a few examples for you. Um, first, we've got a question. If we're given a frequency of light of six times 10 to the 14th Hertz, um, what we might ask is if that light travels over a distance of 60 times 10 to the minus three meters, how many rotations of the phaser will there be? Well, of course, the phaser is rotating with exactly the same frequency as the light. We know that uh, the velocity is going to be the distance divided by the time. And so time is equal to the distance divided by velocity. And the distance we know is 60 times 10 to the minus three meters. Velocity of light is three times 10 to the Eighth, and that is going to give us a total velocity, uh, sorry, a total um, time of 20 times 10 to the minus 11 seconds. So that light is going to travel that distance for a total of 20 times 10 to the minus 11 seconds, if it's in air. The frequency we know is 6 times 10 to the minus 14 cycles per second or hertz and so the total number of rotations if this is the number of rotations per second and that's the total time then the number of rotations as the number of rotations is going to be 6 times 10 to the to the 14th times the amount of time which is 20 times 10 to the minus 11 seconds and I think you'll find that comes out at 120. So it's 6 times 10 to the 14 times 20 times 10 to the minus 11 being the, um, the frequency times the time. And that we said was 120 times 10 to the 3 rotations. So it will uh, rotate 120,000 times. The second question relates to an electron. We've got an electron which is traveling with a velocity of four times 10 to the fifth meters per second. And we're asked to find firstly its kinetic energy. Well, um, that's fairly straightforward. The kinetic energy is a half mv squared. And if you take for the uh, mass of an electron, 9.1 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms, you've got a half of that times this velocity squared, four times 10 to the fifth all squared. And that is going to give you a velocity, if I've calculated it correctly, of 7.3 times 10 to the minus 20. Uh, sorry, that's going to give you a kinetic energy of 7.3 times 10 to the minus 20. Um, oh dear, energy is measured in joules. And now we can say, what is the frequency of the um, electron's wave? We know that E equals HF, which means the frequency is E divided by H. And E, we've just calculated, is 7.3 times 10 to the minus 20, divided by Planck's constant H, uh, which we can take as 6.6 .6 times 10 to the minus 34 and that will give us a frequency of the electron's wave of 1.1 times 10 to the 14 hertz.
And now here is a third question. We're going to do the famous double slit experiment. We've got a source of light monochromatic. We've got our screen. Light, of course, will come from both um, slits to fall on the screen. Normally we talk about the bright spots and the dark spots. But on this occasion, we are told that there are two points on the screen, which we'll label A and B. And um, I can tell you that the light from A, uh, the light arriving at A, the two beams from the two slits arriving at A, have phases like that. And the two beams arriving at B have phases arriving like that. The length of the phases in each case will be the same because it's the same source of light. So lengths are the same. So we now need to find out the resultant length of each of those phases. So at A, we've got vector addition like this. And let's suppose that we say that each, uh, each phaser is um, a length one unit. Then the resultant is going to be the square root of two, that's just uh, one squared plus one squared is um, two and r is going to be the square root of two. Whereas for b, that was of course for a, for b you've simply got vectorial addition like that, each of them is length one, the resultant is two. And now we say what is the respective intensity? Well the intensity is proportional to r squared so in this case, the intensity is going to be proportional to 4. In this case, the intentional intensity, sorry, the intensity here is proportional to 2. Square root of 2 is 2. Sorry, the square of the square root of 2 is 2. Here, the intensity is going to be proportional to 4 because the square of 2 is 4. Consequently, the brightness of the point at B will be 2 times the brightness of A, because 4 is twice 2. 